A reading from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 18. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation, concerning which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intend to bring on it. And at another moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I intended to do to it. Now therefore say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I think probably one of the most easy jobs, and at the same time one of the hardest jobs, would be the job of ex-president, right? It's a pretty good life. You get to go home, retire, actually get to spend time with your family, uh, go out and do some consulting and speaking, make a pretty nice, you know, make decent money. Um, you, you'd think it'd be good, but then it would probably be hard because people aren't playing music every time you enter the room, right? Your secret service detail is a little lower, right? And and as anybody who's retired can attest, it's sometimes hard to be retired and, and imagine if your job, like you got to hear about the other person doing it on the news all the time, right? It would be, it would be a very easy job and yet it would be a hard job at the same time. And in American history, there were few ex-presidencies that were as difficult as the one that belonged to Lyndon Johnson. So Lyndon Johnson in 1964, for those of you who either weren't alive or maybe don't care about history as much as I do, Lyndon Johnson in 1964 won a landslide election year at, the year after coming into office after the Kennedy assassination. And then in 1968, right around the time of the New Hampshire primary, it was looking very clearly like he wasn't even going to win the nomination of his party due to Vietnam and all the turmoil that the country was in. So he, he decided no longer to seek re-election and then went home to his ranch in Texas. Could you imagine that in four years? Landslide victory and then not even being able to win your party's nomination as a sitting president. So it was tough on Lyndon Johnson, but one thing about Johnson, uh, especially if you read the multi-volume uh, biography that's uh, almost completed, I think, uh, by Robert Caro, was that he had an especial talent for friendship. So whenever world leaders came to the United States, they always made sure to stop by Johnson's Texas ranch and just spend time and, and talk to him. Well, one of those world leaders was Helmut Schmidt, the chancellor of what was then West Germany, who went and visited with Johnson and said, it is so great to see where you came from. Is it true that you were born in a log cabin? And Johnson said to him, no, that was Lincoln. I was born in a manger, son. <laughs> now, it's, and the governor of Louisiana, by the way, heard that story and said, oh, that's what LBJ stands for, little baby Jesus. So <laughs> it's very funny that we tell stories like that, but in the ancient world, that was not a joke. That was not humor. That was the state of affairs. In the ancient world, kings were considered divine. 
Now, it didn't matter if it was like Egypt or, or like Persia, where the, where the king was the actual presence of the sun god on earth, right? In the, among the Hittites, they would refer to the king as my son, not S-O-N, but S-U-N, uh, because the king was supposed to represent the presence of the god on earth, right? King Sargon of Akkad did it a little bit differently. He said, well, I'm not... Um, I'm not the actual God. I'm just the, the son of the God. I was adopted. Uh, the kings in uh, the emperors in China, well into the 19th century, claimed that they ruled under what was called the mandate of heaven, that their house had been chosen by the gods, right? Kingship was how you viewed who God was on this earth, was through your king. Now, we might breathe a sigh of relief that we no longer have to worship our leaders. Maybe there's another ex-president that's sad about that, but I'll leave that for another sermon, right? But it is because of this tiny, insignificant nation called Israel that we don't worship our rulers. They were unique in this way. As a matter of fact, well, if you read the story, God is constantly telling the Israelites, please don't have for yourself a king. And in Deuteronomy where it says, well, if you must have a king over you, do not let your king accumulate possessions. Do not let them accumulate wives. Do not let them accumulate anything. But instead, give them the book of the law so that the king would learn to fear the Lord. I would like to propose that. Like we give every president just like a digest of like the Bible, the Koran, Confucius, right? Just wisdom and make them uh, read it and make them show us that they've read it. But I'm, I'm not running for anything, so that's probably going to go nowhere. But this is the difference. In other nations, the kings were gods, or they became God when they died. Among, among, the, among the Hittites... When you said, the king has become a god, what you were really saying was, the king has died. <laughs> right? We don't do that. Among the Israelites, the king served God. And this was very important. Because all of the other nations of the world saw in the fortunes of their nation how powerful their gods were. They viewed their gods as actors on the great stage of the glory of nations. If you had a good king, it meant you had a powerful god. It meant you had peace. It meant you had security. It meant that the stock market was up. It meant that there was rain abundantly for crops. It even might mean that you, you might have better luck because you, you, you live in a kingdom where the, where, the god, where the god is living through the king and, and giving you good things, right? They thought that their kings and gods were actors, in this drama. But in Israel, they had a completely different way of thinking about God, and we start to see it emerge in the words of prophets like Jeremiah. God was not an actor in this drama. God is more like the stage manager. <laughs> and those of you who did drama in high school, right, uh, maybe stage manager wasn't as good as like being one of the actors, but definitely you had a lot of power behind the scenes. I was not a drama guy, but I knew some, right? You had a lot of power behind the scenes. That is who God was for the Israelites. God was God of all of the nations, which, by the way, uh, this is why we don't put flags in sanctuaries, <laughs> because we still confess this about God, that, that, that God is the God of the United States, is the God of Canada, is the God of Azerbaijan, is the God of the Philippines. It is one God. And God, as the stage manager, directs the action. And so that's where we meet God at the potter's house today. He is there with his hands in the clay. And, and listen to what else is being said. All that glory of the nation, what is it? It's just clay. In the ancient world, 
clay was the cheap stuff, right? We might, uh, we might call it Tupperware today, uh, except clay would actually break and biodegrade, and Tupperware is probably sitting in the ocean somewhere. Um, we'll talk about that in Sunday school, right? It was the cheap stuff, right? So kingdoms, nations, armies, just clay for God to have God's hands in. And God reworked and, and reshaped all those kingdoms according to God's will. Now, this is absolutely unheard of in the history of the world. I'm using my history degree today to, to show you how remarkable this is. That what the prophets are saying is that God is even about to turn God's back to the people that God called the people that God led out of the desert, the people that God gave a land. God's there as the stage manager. This nation has turned away from me. It's like a vessel I'm trying to shape, and it's like it's drooping. It's, it's falling over. I, it, but by the way, how many of you have ever uh, worked like with pottery, right? So you know what that's like when you're when you've got something on the wheel and you're trying to shape it in a certain way and it's just not going, or maybe the lip up top is drooping. Yeah, it's hard work. And God's saying, this is my nation, Israel. It's, it's drooping and it's falling over all over the place. I'm going to need to rework this into another vessel. So Jeremiah is the prophet who is speaking right at the time that Jerusalem is besieged and Israel is about to fall to the Babylonians. And, rather, and these prophets are saying, rather than God is going to come and deliver us, we are God's chosen nation, they're saying God is going to smash us apart. Right? God is visiting destruction on God's own people. Now, I understand that that might be heard as a little bit less than good news. And I know there are a lot of preachers out there that use these words of the prophets to kind of scare people. And, and some people will even go picket funerals of, of soldiers using these kinds of, of prophetic words. But they are missing exactly what we are being told about God's relationship to people. God is the one whose hands are on the clay. Even though it's cheap stuff, <laughs> even though it's not what other nations are claiming that it is, God is saying, right, if you are trying to build something and trying to build pottery and it's not just going well, right, sometimes you just get frustrated and you say, all right, enough of this. Let me get some new clay. God tried that once, by the way. This was the story of Noah. All right, people are... People are murdering each other wantonly. This is obviously not what I created the world for. Let me flood it out, right? Let me get water <laughs> and let me erase it and let me start again. All right? This is not what God is doing. God's hands are still on the clay. And by the way, this is who God is. God is a creator, right? This word in Hebrew for potter is, um, and you'll remember this, especially if you watch Looney Tunes, yowser. <laughs> uh, it, I know it's an, it's an older word like yowzers, right? But this is the Hebrew word for potter, the yowser. And it comes from the verb yatsar, which means one who forms, one who makes. So when God says, I'm like a potter, God says, I am a maker. I am a Constantly, I'm an artist. I am constantly one who has my hands on material, making it and shaping it. This verb, yatsar, it shows up in Genesis when it said God did what with the ground? Took the dirt, breathed on it, and made human beings, right? He yatsard us. He formed us in God's hands, right? So this is who God is. And I had a talk with my wife about clay because she is she's a pretty good artist. Would you say, honey? No. no okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's all sorts of clay stuff at our house. We'll do the museum tour later. <laughs> what she told me was just what I showed the children this morning, right? Once your clay 
becomes hard and brittle, it's too late. You can't fix it. You can't add to it. You can't make anything else with it. So when God is talking to Israel this way, God's not talking like, you know, the stage manager at a production of Our Town who's a 17-year-old on a power trip, right? God is talking like an artist, saying that if this stuff becomes brittle, if there's not love here, if there's not faith and trust in me here, if there's not care and justice for the orphan, for the widow, for the, for the foreigner, for the outsider, if these things don't exist, my work of art is going to become brittle and it's going to become garbage. And so what God is doing, just like any good parent, God is saying, I have to do something. I've got to maybe crunch whole sections of this down and, and, and rebuild them. You, you could probably, I've never worked with clay in my life. I'm, you're getting this through my wife's knowledge. So you, those of you who have done it, imagine it right. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to put my hands in this. I'm going, to, I'm going to squeeze. I'm going to massage some things. I might pull some things away. But my hands are going to be on this thing. I'm not going to give up on it. I don't want it to become brittle and useless. So, so God says, and the uh, translation that we used was trying to help a little bit, um, but I think the Hebrew is better, right? The translation says, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you, right? They're trying to capture this. What it says is, I'm going to form disaster for you. Right? And we might struggle with God doing that, right? But God says, I'm going to yatsar, a disaster for you. And, right, it's the same word for yowser, which is the potter. So the Whoever was translating wanted to be clever and show you that they knew their Hebrew, uh, but you really miss it because the, the actual phrase is, I'm going to form a disaster for you. I'm going to devise a plan against you, but listen to what's not being said. But in order to do that, my hands are not going to go anywhere. Right? The potter, if, if you've got a pot spinning on a table in the ancient uh, turntables uh, for pottery, thank you, Anchor Bible Dictionary, uh, <laughs> a wheel at the bottom so that you would kind of move it with your feet because they had no electricity, and it would go up top and then your hands would be free. So, man, potters back then, uh, they were probably like, forget your Pilates and your Zumba, they were probably like the fittest people in Israel because they had to move their feet and move their hands at the same time. Look at all that motion. Look at all that energy. God says, that's who I am. I'm not a sun god sitting up top of the palace waiting for everybody to come worship me and kiss my butt. I'm a potter. My hands are here. I am with you. And because they didn't get the point, 500 years later, God came with hands and nails through them saying, hey, I am with you. And through those crucified hands, God still grabs us, grabs all of the broken pieces that are flinging all over the place. God's feet are still moving and going places and keeping that wheel turning and God's hands are still on that pot and he is still fashioning and molding us. Never stops making who we are. God is always making something new and God gets really bored with the status quo. This, I think, ought to be where faith comes from, right? Everybody thinks that God is just kind of like that sun god in ancient Egypt. Come to the temple, worship me, see my glory. God's out among the people. God coaches from the field, right? God's kind of like a manager, puts on the... I had to get one sports analogy, right? God puts on the uniform <laughs> like us. Though I'd, I'd love to see some of these NBA coaches in basketball shorts. 
And so this is a powerful way to think about who God is. God is that person with hands on us, and you don't even have to call HR about that. God is that person whose hand, nobody else should be putting their hands on you, uh, by the way. But God is that person, yeah, put, put the disclaimer in there. God is that person whose hands are always on us, always on our lives, always on our hearts, always on our heartbreaks, always on our hopes, always on our lives. I, I started to, to do this because I can be a pretty anxious and neurotic person. Those of you who don't know me, those of you who do know me know that, right? I started doing this little prayer. Whenever I, I, I'm out and about and I'm doing visits and I'm going, oh, that didn't go so well, or I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about something that I've got to do, or I'm, I'm having another fight with my wife about working on the weekend, I stop. Oh, man, that was a dirty look. I stop. <laughs> I stop and I take a breath and I say, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Does it make me feel better? I don't know, but at least I stop and I put the anxiety on pause for a minute, right? Because what that is is a confession of faith. God, I know you're not done. When I, uh, I ran some support groups for years at, at Nathan Adelson and I would always end the support group with, so glad you came. And what I want you to know is the way that you are feeling today is not the way that you are always going to feel. <laughs> and I think if God could send just one message and put it, you know, over at Planet Hollywood or Times Square, I don't think he'd be saying, like, repent, shape up, you know, like those billboards. I want to get a billboard from our church saying the way that you're feeling, what you're going through, is not what you're always going to be going through, right? Right? No matter what that is for you, if that's trying to get back on your feet after this pandemic, if that's trying to be in a new place with a relationship that maybe has fallen apart, if you're that one who's grieving the loss of a loved one, if you are just tired <laughs> or you're worn or you've been going to treatment after treatment after treatment or you've got to look at the rest of your life and say, man, is this the career I always, always want to do or where is my life going, right? Whatever you're feeling in those moments, for God to just put his hands on that clay and say, look, I'm here. <laughs> what you're going through, how you're feeling, is not always the way that you are going to feel. And I'm telling you that now, but we get a little glimpse and revelation about the end of time. And it is when finally the new heavens and the new earth descend and the new Jerusalem, and, and it's all done, right? We think it's all done at the end of, uh, at the, end of the Bible, right? We get, we get a peek at the last chapter, and Jesus says... Behold, I am making all things new. English majors, I checked yesterday. That verb is present tense. And in the present tense, it means it's ongoing. Lourdes, you've been to seminary, right? You know that present tense in Greek, right? Yep. I am making all things new. I'm still doing that, even at the end of time. God is with us. Those hands that are shaping the universe are still going. They're still on you and your lives, and they're not done. Amen.